So we're uh, continuing and finishing for now our time of talking about hope and courage. We've kind of talked about it really for three weeks now. Not really a series, but just kind of a prevailing theme, I guess, that has, has come up over the last few weeks. And so we'll be kind of talking about that today. We'll be in Philippians chapter 1, be in those verses primarily. And uh, digging through that concept and finishing that up, hopefully bringing that all together today. So <clears throat> the thing today is, in, in order for something to be powerful, to be used powerfully, in order for something that is powerful to be used powerfully, you have to know how to use it. You have to know how to use something that is powerful in order for it to be used powerfully. Otherwise, it is just existing without its power being used. Kind of like the guy that used an axe to chop down his trees. Now, if he had a good sharpened axe and worked really hard on a good day, he could get about three, maybe five trees cut down. A lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of sweat. It was difficult, but he could make it happen because he was using the axe properly. Well, then one day he decided to go to Sears. And the salesman at Sears showed him a power chainsaw. A chainsaw that had a lot of power in it. And uh, the salesman said, hey, look, you can do that with an axe. You work hard with this thing, you can probably get 40 or 50 trees cut down in a day. Well, obviously the man was convinced pretty easily and decided to buy the chainsaw. And he went home and used it. He didn't really particularly like it. He brought it back to the store. He said, man, this thing is a hunk of junk. He said, I don't like it at all. I'd rather use my ax. He said, well, how many trees did you get cut down? He said, I didn't get one tree cut down. He said, well, how is that even possible? He said, let me see it. He said, does it work? He said, it didn't work for me here. And he handed it to him. And the salesman, boom, he rattled it off, cranked it up. And the guy goes, what's that? <laughs> what's that noise? He said, well, I, I cranked it to be able to use it. So the guy was using it, <laughs> using the chainsaw as an ax. The chainsaw doesn't work very well with an axe. Regardless of the amount of power the chainsaw has, unless you are using it properly, it doesn't really do any good. So he was happy to know that you could crank it, squeeze a trigger, cut down a lot of trees. You have to know where the power comes from in order for it to matter. You have to know how to use it in order for it to matter. That's what we're digging into today. So we're looking at Paul and the Philippians. That's the letter of Philippians. It is a letter to the church at Philippi. We call it Philippians, uh, and it's, many of you know, one of, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible. Um, it's, probably, it's probably my favorite Pauline letter. It's probably my favorite letter that Paul wrote. Uh, some people call it the letter of joy. It talks about joy and rejoicing a lot in this letter, uh, and Paul, you know, is a pretty famous Bible character. Uh, he was born in Tarsus, he was a Jew and a Roman citizen simultaneously, which definitely played to his advantages later on as a missionary. I think all in God's timing, all in God's planning. Uh, and, of course, Paul, you know that if you've read the Bible for five seconds, you know that Paul, or have been in church once or twice, you've probably heard that Paul radically persecuted the church. He was trying to kill out the church after Jesus had ascended and, and the church is, is starting to grow. Paul is trying to kill it. He thinks that they are blasphemers and that they are against God until, as he is going to persecute, arrest, and possibly kill more Jesus followers, he is met on the road to Damascus by Jesus and radically changed forever. Uh, he's blinded by the light, so to speak. You thought that was a song that came from, from the Bible. Paul is blinded by the light. Jesus changes his heart forever, and he goes on to do some amazing things. After that happens, he goes to Jerusalem, and he spends about two weeks there. And he meets Peter, who's obviously the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he meets Jesus' brother, James. Spends about two weeks there, and there's quite the uproar. As you can imagine, this guy that was just in Jerusalem killing, searching out, arresting, torturing, persecuting, and imprisoning Jesus' followers is now back. And he says, hey, I'm, I'm one of you guys now. People weren't particularly keen on Paul being around at that point in time. All part of God's plan, of course. So after two weeks of being there, they got to get him out of there. And they ship him out of there back to his hometown of Tarsus. Now, about 10 years passes while he's in Tarsus. And he's evangelizing during this time. We know that because Barnabas goes and meets him. And, and meets him because he is planting churches and, and evangelizing and spreading the gospel. There's not really any, there's not a lot of scripture that talks about that time. But we know that that time did take place. So he spends about 10 years after being converted 
to Christianity. After, after Jesus has, has radically changed him, he spends about 10 years in his hometown and around his area, evangelizing, growing the church. And then Barnabas comes up to Antioch uh, from Jerusalem, and he has Paul come and assist him in Antioch. And they spend about two years building up the church at Antioch. Uh, they're pastoring this exploding, growing, new, young church, primarily made up of some converted Jews and of Gentiles. For those of you who don't know, Gentile just means non-Jewish. That's the easiest way to put it. So non-Jewish people were becoming Christians. Now, uh, Barnabas and Paul, after spending that time in Antioch, come back to Jerusalem. And they have a little meeting there, and they're trying to decide, hey, how are we going to, what was the organization of the church going to look like? How are you going to do what you're doing? How are we going to do what we're doing? And they decide, hey, me, me being Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, and a few others, we will primarily work on the Jewish converts here in Jerusalem. Paul, you and Barnabas are doing a fantastic job doing what you're doing, being a missionary to the Gentiles. You go back to where you were, you go on a missionary journey, and you spread the church in the Gentile area. Again, all part of of God's miraculous plan. So that's when Paul goes on his, what we call the first missionary journey, although he had already been doing it for about 12 years. He goes on his first missionary journey, commissioned by the church, and he and, he and Barnabas, and they go out and they plant churches in Poseidon, uh, more in Antioch, Arconium, Lystra, Derby, and then they return back to Antioch in Syria. And then there's a lot of Gentiles added to the church. And there's a great problem. What are we going to do with all these Gentiles? Right? That, that the simplest way for us to put that would be uh, American and another nationality. Okay? It's not, that, that analogy doesn't hold water all the way through, but it's kind of similar. Like, they've got a culture, they've got a way of being, they've got a language, they've got a way of doing things, and now these different people with completely different ideas on how to do life are coming in to this thing called the church. They're coming into this way. They're coming into following Jesus, and they're not quite sure how they're going to handle that. So that's when we have the Jerusalem Council. This is in Acts. For those of you that, uh, you know, open your Bibles during the week, spend some time in Acts. It's fun. Jesus, or excuse me, in Jerusalem, they have a council. This is about A.D. 48. We're about 15 years now after Jesus has resurrected and gone back to heaven and delivered the Holy Spirit, and the church has been growing now for about 15 years. And it's growing with, primarily at this point, Gentiles. So what are we going to do with these Gentiles is the Jewish question to the Christian church, to Jesus' church. So Paul and Barnabas and Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, and others in the church, other apostles in the, in, at the time, other leaders at the time, they decide that Gentiles don't have to get circumcised, but they should kind of respect a couple of customs, Jewish customs, for unity's sake, and then that's it. They send them back. And at that point, the Gentile Christians in the world said, Whew. <laughs> glad we dodged that one. That's great. Didn't have to do that, so that's cool. So ever since then, that's kind of been the prevailing thought when spreading the Christian church. In other words, don't make it harder than it has to be. Submit your life to Jesus, and don't you know, eat blood from animals, which I don't think any of us do anymore, and pretty much go on and love each other, and, and that's pretty much what we got to do. So then... Paul and Silas leave out on their second missionary journey. This is about 48, 49 A.D. At this point, as they, as they plant some churches and they get to about 50, 51 A.D., this is when they plant the church at Philippi. Okay? This is the, the group of people that Paul is writing this letter to. So he's been doing this for a while. He's already gone on one missionary journey. He's had two, two meetings in Jerusalem. He's been persecuted. He's been imprisoned already. It's not been very easy, and he goes to Philippi, and he plants the church of Philippi, which is the first European church, the first church planted on the European continent, about 50, 51 A.D. is where we are now. And Paul uh, goes on and plants many more churches. He goes on a third missionary journey, and eventually you know that he gets arrested. He winds up in prison, in house arrest, in Rome, and this is about 10 years after he has planted the church, in Philippi. Now, why all this lesson? And it's not just because I'm a history geek and I like talking about history. I am a history geek and I do like talking about history, but that's not why. It's to understand the background and the context in which this letter is written. Paul loves the church at Philippi. They have been in existence for about 10 years when Paul writes this letter back to them. 
and they are dealing with some things, some false teachers, some persecution. As we've said many times, this is the time of Nero. Nero was not very nice to Christians. Nero wasn't very nice in general, but he especially wasn't nice to Christians. So Paul is writing this letter from prison, which is house arrest, chained to a Roman guard. That's how they made sure you didn't get away back then. They didn't have ankle monitors. You had your ankle attached to this big Roman dude, and you couldn't run away because he wouldn't let you. And he's chained there for about two years. He's allowed visitors. He's allowed people to come in. He's allowed to write, but he's allowed, not allowed to go anywhere. He's, he's imprisoned in his own home, and you have to pay for that yourself during this time. So Paul writes many letters, one of which is the letter to the Philippians during this time, all part of God's marvelous wonderful plan and he writes this letter to the church at philippi and it's a response to the problems that they're having and it's a thank you for the financial gift they have sent him so that he can continue this house arrest uh, and not go into debt to the to rome epaphroditus probably the pastor at philippi brings him this letter and then from them and this financial gift and then he writes a letter back to them that letter is the one we're looking at today and that's the context in which it's taking place Paul has done all this stuff and gone through all these things, and he is literally in prison in Rome awaiting trial for a capital offense. For those of you who don't know, a capital offense means that if you're found guilty, then you die. So he's not in a very pleasant spot in his life when he writes this letter. That's where we're picking it up at the end of the first chapter here today. So if you're there with me, it's verse 27, chapter 1. Here we go. Just one thing, Paul says, just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I have. You saw that I have it, and now you hear that I have it. So Paul starts off the, the, the end of chapter 1. He, he, he kind of culminates what he's already talked about to the, to the Philippians. He says, but just this one thing, solo, one thing. This one thing. Make sure you're doing this one thing. Just one thing as citizens of heaven. Live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. One thing. In light of it all is what that, that word there in Greek means. In light of it all. In light of all you've been through. And all I've been through. All the things going on in my personal life and in your life there in Philippi. Everything. Above all. At all costs. All that is encompassed in that one Greek word. Have this single mindset, Paul says. No matter what you're going through, have one single mindset. Live your life as citizens of heaven. Live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Now that, that citizens of heaven thing, you know, we write songs about it now and we talk about it, but to the, to the Philippians, that would, have, that would have really meant something to them. They really would have, would have got what Paul was saying when he said that. The word there is politeia, which is like politics in English, politia for citizens. Now, the Philippians were some proud Romans. The Philippians was a, was a Roman colony. It wasn't just a territory. It wasn't just taken over by the Romans. It was a Roman colony. Okay, so the title of something like that is Us Italicum, which means where you are is the same as Rome. Your soil is Roman soil. You are Roman citizens. Therefore, you have the rights of Roman citizens. You also have the responsibility of Roman citizens. So these are a proud people. They're a fairly well-to-do people. They matter. They're the leader of the district of Macedonia in this area, which is present-day Greece, is where we're talking about. So when he says be citizens of heaven, that word would have instantly made sense to them because they are very, very proud citizens of Philippi and therefore very, very proud citizens of Rome. And when you're a citizen of Rome, that carries weight. It means there's things you should do, and there's, means there's things that you're afforded because you are a citizen of Rome. So they had a great cause for civic pride in being a citizen of Philippi and a citizen of Rome. And Paul says, more importantly, the language here that he uses is, more importantly, you're citizens of heaven. 
You're not just citizens of Philippi. You're citizens of heaven. And if you, as a citizen of Philippi, if that carries weight with you and tells you how you should live and tells you what you should do, and, and it matters to you, even more so and utmost to that, you should understand that you are a citizen of heaven and therefore you should live your life worthy of that citizenship. You were bought at an ultimate price, Paul is saying, to be a citizen to, of the kingdom of heaven, of God's kingdom, of Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom he has started and will continue to reign over for all eternity. Live worthy of the gospel, worthy of the price paid for you to have the rights of a citizen of heaven, heirs to God's kingdom. And what, what is the right afforded to those that are citizens of heaven? Well, first and foremost, <laughs> eternal life. It's a pretty nice right. It's a pretty nice inheritance that God gives to to his followers, to the citizens of heaven. So he says, hey, you are getting an, the ultimate gift, eternal life. Live your life like that matters. Live your life worthy of that. Live your life worthy of being a citizen of God's kingdom, not just of Philippi. And he goes on, then, whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Remember, he's in prison. So whether I get to come see you, in other words, whether I get out of prison or not, I may get to come see you. My life may end with only hearing about you again. And I may not even get that luxury. But hopefully I'll hear about how well you're living, how well you're doing, how well you're being a citizen of heaven. He says, I will hear about you that you are what? How are you to be a citizen of heaven? Standing firm in one spirit, in one accord. Contending together. Standing firm. <laughs> Let me hear that you have courage and your commitment as a citizen of heaven, that you are living courageously, you're standing firm with one spirit, one mind, one soul. The word used there literally is soul. In other words, the word that encompasses everything about you. One mind, one spirit, one soul, one unit, one army. Because the association of contending, that word there, contending, carries with it like a, a military aspect. So be one army with one mind, knowing that you're fighting one battle, one war with one enemy. Contend, be courageous, stand firm, keep fighting. Be a, be a gladiator-like battler, knowing that the battle you're fighting is literally over life and death. Battle, fighting for what, he says there. Fighting for what? Contending together for what? For faith, for faith in the gospel. What is faith? We define that simply here. We try to define that very simply here. It's belief, hope, trust in Jesus in action. That's what faith is. You have your belief, your trust, your hope is in Jesus as Savior, and therefore that carries out into your life. Because a faith that doesn't act is a dead faith, James tells us. A faith should be in action, or it is no faith at all. Faith in the gospel, belief, hope, and trust in Jesus as your one and only true Savior, your one and only true hope, that is to see him and everyone that has contended for the faith forever one day. Faith takes courage, and courage takes faith. End of the discussion. Faith takes courage, and courage takes faith. In other words, we have to be inspired. What does the word inspired mean? It literally means to have the Spirit inside you. That's what it means to be inspired. It's not an emotion. It's a deep-seated foundation of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is inside of you, and it is making you, allowing you, prodding you. Up here, I'm begging you to live courageously, to contend for the faith. One mind, in unity, one spirit, one soul. You have to have courage, courage to act, courage to do Courage to say what needs to be said. Courage to fight. Courage to never, ever lay down your spiritual arms. Courage to keep fighting. Keep fighting for what? For our rights? That's what you'd fight for if you were in Philippi. You'd fight for your rights as a Roman citizen, as a citizen of Philippi. No, we're not fighting for our rights. We willingly lay down our rights. We're fighting against evil. We're fighting against suffering. We're fighting against harm. We're fighting against loss. We're fighting against sin. We're fighting against Satan. We have one enemy. That's what we're fighting against. Not each other, not other human beings. We're not fighting against 
the powers to be of this world. It's a spiritual battle. It's a never-ending battle in this life. But it's a battle, thank God, that Jesus has already won. We're just being allowed to continue to fight it for our own good and for God's own glory. But ultimately, it's already been decided. This battle's already been decided. He goes on there in verse 28. Not being frightened in any way by your opponents. We talked a little bit about this last week. We're not frightened by our opponents. We're not frightened by threats. We're not frightened by anything unless it could cost you your life. That's what that verse says, right? I mean, if it, if it, your reputation, maybe, yeah. Your job, maybe, I'm not sure. Some money, yeah, we'll, we'll give that up too. But, but not our life. Is that what it says? Not be frightened in any way but your life by your opponents? Is that what it says? What does it say? What does it say, Stuart? Not, not being in any way. In any way. So what about, yep, that covers that. When you throw in that what about, yeah, it covers that. Okay, you can't tear the page out and say, well, that doesn't count. That page counts too. That verse counts too. Not being frightened in any way by your opponents. No, thro- no threat, no punishment, no loss, nothing in this world can frighten someone that has the courage of the Spirit living inside of them. The courage of the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit that lived in Jesus. Not scared. We are strong and courageous, like we talked about Wednesday night. Right, students? We are strong and courageous. Moses tells Joshua, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Joshua tells Israel, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. David tells Solomon, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Paul's now telling the Philippians, don't be afraid. No matter what, be strong and courageous. And his word is telling all of us today, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Act. Live out your life with courage. That's what faith is, regardless of the prospect of any type of loss that could be put in front of us in this world. And he goes on there, he says, this, this what? What we just said, living out our life that way. A Jesus follower living out their life that way is this. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. When we contend together, battle together, fight together, go against this world, the spiritual world, sin and suffering together, battle together. When we are courageous in faith together, it is a sign. It is a reminder. It is a message. That's what a sign does, right? You see a sign on the road, and it tells you something. It tells you where to go or what to do. It is a sign. And that sign of us doing that and living and fighting together. That sign is a sign, it's a reminder, it's a message to us and to the world that we are saved. Now, outside of our world, that word doesn't get used a whole lot. Saved. Or we can go real old school. We can say born again. I like that. Born again, saved. From what? From all of it. From it all. (laughs) From sin from suffering, from loss, from saved from all of it. Saved from, from Satan, saved from hell. We don't like to say that very often anymore. I don't mind to say it. Jesus talked about it a lot. We're saved from hell. What is hell? Hell is existence without God. Hell is existence with everything we think we want and then find out we don't want it, but now we're stuck with it forever. That's what hell is. Hell is the most awful thing you can possibly think of and then times it by infinity. We're saved from all of that. We're saved, in other words, from ourselves. We're saved from ourselves by a loving God that wants you with him forever and ever and ever and ever. He wants all of us together forever and ever and ever. Saved from all the things that make this world barely bearable sometimes. His plan, his power, his purpose. It's from God. It's all part of his design. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. <clears throat> That's one of those that it's like, you got to chew on that a little bit. It's not easy to swallow that one. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. God gives the gift of belief, of faith, but he also gives the gift of the power to suffer for him, to join in with our Lord, to join in with Jesus and in his suffering, to prove our love, to prove 
our faith to the world. It's a gift. You have to chew on that one for a while. You may not swallow that one until about 2 or 3 o'clock today. It's a gift from God. But anything God gives a gift to do, He has the power to use. We won't use the chainsaw as an axe. If He gives you the gift to suffer, He'll give you the power to get through it. He'll give you the power to glorify Him. He'll give you the power to endure. He will, through His Spirit. So be strong and courageous in faith and suffer in this short life. To do that is a gift granted from God and one that he will take care of you in. Finishing up there in verse 30, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. That's why all that background information kind of brings that to life for me. You are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now you've heard that I have again. See, when Paul and Silas first went to Philippi, you know that story. They heal someone, right? They heal the slave girl. People aren't very happy about that. Why? Because it costs them money. Notice the prevailing theme. It costs them money, and they were not very happy with Paul and Silas. What did they do with them? Stripped them, beat them, flogged them, imprisoned them for helping someone. The church of Philippi saw that. They saw Paul suffer, and that's what he's referencing there. You saw what I had to go through. You saw it then, and now you hear that I'm in prison again. Ten years ago, you saw my agon, is the word he uses there in the Greek, which we would use the word agony. We have the same agony together, he says. My agony is your agony and is Jesus' agony, but it's all worth it, is what Paul says. You, you heard about it. You know about it. Why does that really matter? Well, as he's writing this letter to the Philippians while he's in jail, there's false teachers and false preachers that are coming around and saying, hey, if Paul was real, he wouldn't be going through this stuff. Hey, if Paul really had faith in Jesus, he wouldn't be in jail. He wouldn't have gotten, he wouldn't have gotten hurt that first time. You don't need to follow Paul. You need to follow me. To which the church should say, I'm not following either one. I'm following Jesus. Okay? The moment we put our faith in a pastor or denomination or a church building, or anything else other than Jesus, we are putting our faith in something that is false and will ultimately let us down. But Paul's reminding them, hey, <laughs> I was struggling then, and I'm struggling now, and Jesus struggled, and this name it and claim it, follow Jesus and life will be great stuff, it's bunk, and y'all know how I feel about that. I can't stand it. Why? Because his word, whatever copy you want to grab, his word says that you will struggle. You will have a, simul, a similar agon. We will struggle in this life, but we will struggle for a purpose. We will struggle as a gift from God, and it will ultimately glorify him. So that's why he's saying that. He's reminding them, hey, I did it then. I'm doing it now. I was real then. I'm real now, and it's part of it. It's part of life. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> that's what I would have put in there. That's why I didn't get to write it. But <laughs> Right? I mean, just suck it up. So along those lines, right, along all that we just talked about, but where, where Paul is and what he's gone through and what he's reminding them of and what he's telling them to do, if we jump back a few verses, you kind of get a summation, I think, of what Paul is talking about there. So if you go back to verse 20, he says it pretty clear. I love the way he says it here. He says, so even though I'm in jail and blah, 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 and all that stuff is going on, my eager expectation and hope, there it is, hope and courage, they're always together. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything but that now, as always, with all courage, there they are, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by le life or by death. Verse 21, one that we know, many of you know. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. However long you're drawing breath, you're drawing breath so that you can honor and glorify Jesus with your life. And then when you're not drawing breath anymore, then it just gets better. It gets better beyond what we could possibly imagine. Amen. Thank you, God, for that truth. That's my hope. With all courage, I'll live out my life in a way that honors Christ. And however long he makes me keep doing that here, then hopefully I'll do it with honor. But when he stops making me do it here, to die is gain. That's what Paul said. That was true then, and it's true now. So if we want to put it in one, one statement that hopefully you can remember, here's the 4 or 5% that maybe we remember when we walk out of here. 
Courage to trust empowers us to live worthy of the gospel. Courage to trust whatever you are going through and whatever you're experiencing. Courage to trust that God has you through that will empower you. It will give you hope and courage. It will inspire you with the Spirit deep down to live a life worthy of the gospel. And one day, one day it'll all make sense to all of us. And I pray that if you've never had the Spirit put inside of you through faith in Jesus, that today is the day of salvation. Today. Let us celebrate that with you. Come down during this last song, and we'll talk through it and make sure that you're there and you understand it, and then we'll turn around and the church will celebrate with you here and in heaven because we're going to do whatever we can, all that we can, to make heaven as crowded as we can.